be continuing on Romans chapter 3 today. This is the first Sunday that me and I have both been here in about a month. So. <laughs> uh, but if you were, those that were here, if you recall, we looked at the what's often called total depravity in the last several verses. How the man is wicked by nature. And really the we're still on the same topic here in our text today, but Paul begins to speak a little more metaphorical. Or we'll look at verses 13 through 18, Romans chapter 3, Paul writes, Their throat is an open sepulchre, with their tongues they have used deceit, the poison of asp is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness, their feet are swift of shed blood, destruction and misery are in their ways, and the way of peace have they not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. So here, after he tells us there's none good, there's none righteous, there's none that seek after God, he begins to describe these people, things they do and say. Right. It's really, it's characteristic of all of us if we were not saved, or before we were saved. He says their throat is an open sepulcher. Mm -hmm. This comes from Psalms chapter 5, verse 9. But I think we all know a sepulcher or a tomb or a grave is a place that's full of corruption and stink. Mm -hmm. Especially in those days when they didn't have the embalming processes that we do. If you remember from when Lazarus was raised, as Martha said, he, by now he stinks. Right. Because it had been a few days and that corruption and that rot had set in. Paul well, here the scriptures describe natural man as having a, a throat that is like an open sepulcher that it just spews out filth, if you will, that is full of corruption, full of stuff that is unpleasant. And he says here, their throat is an open sepulcher, and just like the grave, the throat. Seems to never be satisfied, but continually it seeks to devour, continually it seeks right. to spew forth its spills. You don't have to be around lost people very long and realize that that's exactly how they conduct themselves. Though. Right. He says next that they, with their tongues, they have used deceit. Once they deceive them, what they say, or by their speech, they are deceptive. In Psalms 5 9, where <clears throat> Paul is quoting from, he, it says that they use flattery, that they deceive people in order to flatter them. And it's always to make some benefit of their own, though. Right. Just like the prosperity preachers, they, they'll flatter you and tell you good things but so they can line their own pockets. That's it. I, on the way here, I saw a, a church sign. It said, sign, broken message inside. Well, to me, that seems a little deceptive. I mean, the sign obviously wasn't broken. I know their intent. If we're not careful, we'll, we'll use deception and try to trick people. And, yeah. But yet, that's never a means by which we should share the gospel. It's never a means by which we should do anything. Right. Well, our God is a God of truth. Scripture says that he cannot lie. Right. We should be a people of truth and we should not be dishonest in our dealings and our way we speak. We shouldn't speak with deception and with flattery and try to gain the, the approval of men. Yeah, that's exactly what the natural man will do, though. Right. He'll try, he'll try to smooth things over, make them sound good, and so he himself can benefit. Whether he, it's whether he can gain something out of it, or whether he can look good in the eyes of other men. But so it should not be with the people of God. Amen. He says there, 
Those in open sepulchre with their tongues they have used to see their, the poison of acid under their lips. This comes from <clears throat> Psalms as well, Psalm 140, verse 3. I thought, interesting to note that says this about the asp. It's a small and most venomous serpent, the bite of which is fatal unless the bitten part be immediately cut away. Hmm. Here the scripture is likened the mouth and the tongue unto this asp here. That's immediately deadly in its actions. And it's, we turn over to James chapter 3, we'll see him describing the power of the tongue how it's used wickedly, James chapter 3. Again, verse number 4 through verse 6, he says, Behold also the ships which, though they be so great and are driven with fierce wind, yet they are turned about with a very small helm, whithersoever the governor listed. Even so the tongue is a little member, and boasteth great things. Behold, how great a matter a little fire kindleth, and the tongue is a fire of the world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members that defileth the whole body, and setteth on fire the course of nature, and is set on fire of hell. Mm -hmm. That our, our tongue can cause lots of problems, can it? Right. right. It's a very powerful thing, especially to be such a small thing. Mm -hmm. Yet it causes lots of problems and lots of hurt. I know growing up in the 90s, we always had sticks and stones and break my bones, the virgin never hurt me, but that's really not quite accurate. You're right. Oh, man can use his words to do lots of damage. Mm -hmm. yeah. Damage to reputations, damage to testimonies, damage to really even the church. can use it in Probably most hurtful and disgusting ways. Mm -hmm. That man has lots of power in the tongue, and yet James says that we can just bridle that little member. Mm -hmm. it, it takes lots of self discipline, though, to bring the tongue under control. Amen. I like what Spurgeon once said. He said, be careful letting your tongue out on your brains. Mm, that's it. If we're not careful, we'll speak before we think. We'll say things we ought not to say. We'll perhaps in a fit of emotion, whether it be anger or jealousy or something like that, we will say things that are not becoming of a child of God. But the natural man, he is just given over to these things and continually... <laughs> That corruption and wickedness and this poison here that it's described, it continually flows out of their mouth. Mm -hmm. Let's turn it back to Psalm chapter 50 real quick and note one thing. Psalm chapter 50 and verse number 19. And then we'll skip down to verse 21. Psalms 50 and verse 19 here, God is speaking and he's describing the wicked. Verse number 19, it says, Thou givest thy mouth to evil and thy tongue frameth deceit. He knows in verse 21, he, he says, These things hast thou done, and I kept silence. Thou thoughtest that I was altogether such as one as thyself, but I will reprove thee and set them in order before thine eyes. Now consider this. Ye that forget God, lest I tear you in pieces, and there be none to deliver. God will not take lightly the misuse of our tongue, using it for deception. Yeah. We can be sure. Maybe Christ said that we'll give an account for every idle word that we speak. You're right. But if we would ever just stop and consider how. Oftentimes we misuse the tongue, and especially before the Lord saved us, how we misused it. Yeah, that should be a, a humbling thought. Amen. That we would use 
what God gave us to praise Him and glorify Him but for corruption and for sinfulness and wickedness. Yet the natural man is that's exactly what he's going to follow. Mm -hmm. His mouth is full of corruption, it's full of wickedness, it's full of deception, it's full of this filthiness. In the last, or excuse me, in the next verse, verse 14, he says, Whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. That comes from Psalms 10, verse 7. But these here are the same people that Paul's continuing to describe. And after he says that their tongues are used deceitfully and they have poison coming from their mouths, he goes on mm -hmm. to say that they're full of this cursing and bitterness. You shouldn't be surprised when wicked men talk like wicked men to get right. At the same time, it shouldn't. We shouldn't be okay with those things. That's right. You know, this cursing literally means the, to say a curse. You know, we often think of it as cuss words, and that's part of it. And some of those are that. But anytime we really speak evil against God or another person, then we are practicing this cursing here. Right. Actually, the, the GD word is the what, the worst one a person can use. But right. They're literally pronouncing the curse upon God. Yeah, you, you might be surprised, you might not, but you just go out among the wicked and you'll hear that all right. around like it's just another word. Because mm -hmm. yeah, that's exactly what the natural man is given to, is to do those type of things. They're full of cursing and bitterness, it says. This bitterness is but they're harsh and wicked in their speech. If you around anyone who's a bitter person, they're usually mean and hostile in the way they talk and act. But yet, sin only does that. It hardens us more and more until left unchecked, sin will bring us to a place where we're just full of cursing and bitterness. Right. We know sin brings pleasure for a season, but ultimately, as yeah. we see, it brings misery, doesn't it? It brings it's bitterness. Bad. It brings hard heartedness. Even for a child of God, if we get into such a state, it will bring us down to that. But for the unsaved, that's where it will just lead to more and more and more. It doesn't take a historian or even a theologian to see that that's been the case throughout all of history. That man generally speaking, is a, a bitter and hostile species. Right, amen. Verse 15, he says, their feet are swift to shed blood. This seems to come from Isaiah chapter 59, verse seven. And here he, he turns from their speech to what they do, their actions, and says their feet are swift to shed blood. They're, they quickly run to kill them, to, to murder. They're, in fact, First John tells us if we hate our brother, we're guilty of murder. Mm -hmm. Hatred is in the heart of the natural man. And it will show itself and left, again, left to itself, left unrestrained, it will eventually come to the place to, right. to where we do physically murder. This man is by nature ready to kill and to murder and to shed blood. And this is really in the heart of all men. Thanks be to God, if He saved you, if He's given you a new heart. Mm -hmm. That natural heart is given over to this type of thing. Sin, you could just study the history of mankind. We see over and over again, we, we like to shed blood, don't we? We like to Sin. kill and the war and the fight. This goes all the way back to Cain and Abel in Genesis chapter 4. Cain was angry with because his offering wasn't except in Abel's was. So, right. So he killed his brother. And that was only the first generation of man after Adam and Eve. That's it. The man has been full of this wickedness ever since the fall. We do see it maybe displayed a little more 
unrestrained more and more, but man has been just as fully wicked from that day to this day. All the way starting with the first murder came, man has been full of this desire for shedding of blood. Amen. He says their feet are swift to shed blood, destruction, and misery are in the ways, verse 16. This also appears to come from the same verse in Isaiah 59, 7, but this is exactly where sin leads, mm -hmm. destruction and misery. This calamity, troubles, hardship is what that means. But anywhere, any which way that man goes without God leads to destruction and misery both in this life and in eternity. We saw in the previous chapter, he said, tribulation and anguish upon every soul that, what is it, verse 9 of chapter 2, tribulation and anguish upon every soul of man that doeth evil. Sin always brings about that anguish, that trouble, that tribulation. Amen. Sin always brings about hardships, I sometimes try to think of how the world would have been had there not been sin entered in. Mm. It's really a, unfathomable to Amen. our carnal minds. Amen. There would have been no death, there would have been no suffering, there would have been no pain. For you ladies, if you had no pain in childbirth, for the men, we wouldn't have to go out and work by the sweat of our brow every day. Right. Yet sin always brings down to that level of suffering. We don't have to turn to all these, but Matthew 7, 13 tells us that in reading that straight gate, for wide is the gate, broad is the way that leads unto destruction, and may there be to go in there at. Mm -hmm. See, that is the ways of the world. I've often said that be, they think there's many different ways because the way is so wide. Mm -hmm. One's walking on the left side of the way, one's walking in the middle, one's walking on the right side. Right. And they seem to be going different ways, but yet they're ultimately all going the same direction. Mm -hmm. Second Thessalonians 1 9 tells us that all the unbelievers will be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of God. See, that is the ultimate end of all those who are not saved, all those who don't believe in Christ. They will be punished with the everlasting destruction. Again, that's a, a concept that's hard to comprehend in this flesh. That mm -hmm. we think of it's going to be burnt, burned up, and then done away with. But no, that destruction is going to last for all of eternity. So mm -hmm. let's go back to Matthew for a moment. Matthew chapter 13. Here Christ is giving several parables. We'll look at verses 49 and 50. Now, go ahead and read verse 47, 48 as well to get the whole context here. It says, Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a net that was cast in the sea and gathered of every kind, which when it was full, they drew to shore and sat down and gathered the good into vessels but cast the bad away. So shall it be at the end of the world. The angels shall come forth and sever the wicked from among the just and shall cast them into the furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Amen. Here we see that for the wicked, the unjust, that's going to be their end. They'll be cast in this, what's described as a furnace of fire or wailing and gnashing of teeth. I think that's the lake of fire described in Revelation. Mm -hmm. Wherein all those who are unsaved are cast, or death and hell are cast. And it says the beast and the false prophet are there in the form day and night, forever and ever. Yet that's the ultimate end of sin. It's a pretty bad everlasting destruction from the presence of God. You know, sometimes we look out and see the, the wicked and how good they seem to have it, and we're like Asaph in Psalm 73. 
So if I'm doing all this in vain, serving God in vain, because they've got a good, yet I've got troubles. Right. You can be sure the wicked, they have troubles too. You just might not see it in public. Right. It would be good to do like Asaph and remember their end. That's what he, if you recall from that psalm, he goes on to say, saying how he was, he had about slipped, he had about given up. He thought he was doing it all in vain, and yet, he says, until I went to the house of God and understood their end. It doesn't matter how prosperous the wicked are in this world, they're, the end is going to be the same. That's going to be that everlasting destruction. Right. Separate and apart from Christ, that's where all of us would go. Go back to our text in Romans 3. These last two verses really are the key to why man is the way he is. Romans 3 verse 17 says, In the way of peace have they not known. This mm -hmm. comes from Isaiah 59 verse 8. But without God, man does not know real peace. Amen. In fact, I don't believe he can know real peace without God. Yeah. One, Galatians 5.22 tells us that peace is the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, and peace is the third one listed. Without the Spirit, one could not have that real peace. Also, Isaiah 26 verse 3 tells us that God gives peace to those who keep their mind on Him. Amen. And again, Isaiah 57.21 God said there is no peace for the wicked. Right. You hate. Man does not understand real peace. Amen. Man makes peace treaties and times of war. And we may live in, sometimes in a, a peaceful state, but yet, as history shows, man once again goes right back to fightings and wars and right back to shedding the blood, right back to worries and troubles. Right. You know, the difference is in Christ we can have real lasting peace. Mm -hmm. We'll see this in chapter five of Romans when we get there that really peace only comes through the person of Christ. Mm -hmm. have, uh, I think it's in, in the first or second close Thessalonians Paul told them that and they cry peace and safety, then sudden destruction shall come upon them. That's prevailed upon a woman. A man might cry peace for a little while, but yet real peace only comes from God. Mm -hmm. Amen. The way of God is the way of peace, not the ways of this world. So that doesn't mean it's going to be easy and without troubles, but yet there's peace there. When stock market crashes, we can have peace that God is going to provide. Amen. When the wicked seem to be ruling and reigning and having their way, we can have peace that we know God is still in control. When things don't go our way, we can have peace that God is working all things together for our good. Amen. The way of God is the way of peace. It's, it's not You'll be ignorant to think it's a way of easy, easy time and without hardships, but yet so when the world goes through hardships, they worry, don't they? They, they fret over what's going to happen. Right. Yet when we keep our minds stayed on God, we can have peace even in the storm. Mm -hmm. and that's, Peter is a good example of that. He was able to walk out upon the water with Christ until he took his eyes upon, off him. And he was fearful of the storm that was coming. Mm -hmm. It's really the same way with us. We can, have, like, we can have great peace even in trying times if we keep our mind on Christ. But when we look to the world, we can be sure there will be trouble, we'll be fearful. Mm -hmm. I know God has a plan with Biden being a office, we get to the flesh, that doesn't seem a very peaceful thing. Mm -hmm. But uh, we know God, he, he sets up kings and removes kings and princes. He sets up governments and removes them as well. 
There's a peace which passes understanding that only can come through Christ. Amen. The world does not know anything about that. They, they can't understand it. They can't comprehend it. That's why it says here, the way of peace, had they not known. We ought to be very thankful to people if we are saved that he has given us this peace. He's lost. They've never known this peace. I'm thinking from a, a carnal aspect, I can't imagine what it would be like to live in today's world and not have the peace of God. Right. Okay, we'll go on to verse 18 and we'll close. Here is the biggest factor, I think. There is no fear of God before their eyes. There you go. This comes from Psalms 36, verse 1. But this is the reason why sin runs rampant in today's world. There's no fear of God before their eyes. Fear or reverence is what it means. There's no fear for his being or his character, his holiness, his justice, his wrath. And by and large says, who is God? If you recall back, I think it's in Exodus chapter 5, when Moses come before Pharaoh and say, let my people go. What did Pharaoh say? He said, who is the Lord that I should hearken unto him? All right. Pharaoh had no fear of God before him. But so is the lost today. And so is really the nature of man to say, who is God that I should obey him? Right. And many people, they might have a fear of hell. And there's not necessarily nothing wrong with that, but usually their fear of hell is more on a carnal level. They, they are afraid of sufferings and fire. Not the reason why they're going there. All right. And we ought to fear him who has power to cast in the hill. Luke, 20, Luke 12, verse 5 says, Fear not him which can destroy the body, but fear him which can destroy both body and soul in hell. I think that's actually Matthew's version. Luke says, Fear him which hath power to cast in the hill. Mm -hmm. Things like capital punishment, harsh punishment, crime, or good, good things. And, okay, not contrary to scripture, but yet. Without a fear of God, without a fear of even a carnal authority, man will not be deterred by those things. Right. Man will still commit the most heinous of crimes without any fear of God. Because he doesn't... Man might sometimes fear punishment, but ultimately his desire for sin will outweigh those fears. Mm -hmm. Fear or reverence for God is what this world really needs. There's no, no reverence for God today, no reverence for his word or his church. No, there's no fear much at all today, is there? No fear for authority or... Yet one day they will stand before God and they will tremble and try to hide their face from him. Right. But we ought to fear him who create this world and could just as easily speak it out of existence as, just as easily as he spoke it into existence. Amen. I'm going to turn over and look at one place here in Genesis chapter 20. I believe Abraham understood what a place without fear of God would do. Genesis chapter 20, even though he used it as a, a bit of an excuse. The end of the chapter here, he says he was journeying in Gerar. And, you know, if you remember Abimelech, king sent for him. He made up a, a little bit of a, a lie, even though it was, wasn't completely untrue. He said Sarah was his wife, not his, or his sister, not his wife. She was, she was apparently his half sister. But, right. If you notice in verse number eleven. When after Abimelech took her and was bothered by, in a dream by taking another man's wife, Abraham answers him and says, And Abraham said, Because I thought surely the fear of God is not in this place, and they will slay me for my wife's sake. That's what the place where the fear of God would do. Right. It's kill and destroy to get what it wants. Yeah. yeah, that's what even our country is doing today, isn't it? 
Mm -hmm. Abortion is probably the most literal example of that. People are killing out of convenience sake or because they don't want to be burdened with a child or whatever it may be because it wasn't planned. But that's exactly where a place without the fear of God leads. Amen. A place that does whatever it wants without considering the consequences. Mm -hmm. Does whatever it wants and says the word of God, that's outdated. The Bible, it's, it's no longer valid today. But who is God that we should obey him? That's where no fear of God leads. Right. And it'll eventually lead to a, a lawless and wicked society. I think each one of us would say, well, I don't know how it get any worse, and yet it, it still does somehow. <laughs> there you go. If there's no fear of God before the rise. What we need just ultimately is a, folks to be saved, but a, a fear of God before them is what they need to understand. Even among God's people, there's not a fear of God like there ought to be. We, we live our lives and do our own things, and yet if we truly reverence God like we ought to, we really reverenced His, His holiness and His righteousness and just His, His magnificence, and I think we would serve Him a lot greater than we do. Amen. Let us fear Him. Let us stand in awe of Him, for truly He is a great God. But if you don't, if you don't know Him, you can't know that peace. You can't have that real reverence for Him unless you've been born again. Right. Well, if you're not saved, then you will just continually go after more and more in the sin. Ultimately, destruction and misery will be your end. But if you've been saved, thanks God for His deliverance. Amen. Close that thought.